for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is director Dave Moore and shoe designer Wendy Holden. Director Dave Moore is an East Coast guy who studied theater at the University of Maryland and film at NYU's prestigious film school. Uh, while he was at the film school, he won three awards in excellence on um, the films you were doing. Why didn't you concentrate on film instead of going into theater? Uh, well, I, I actually uh, still do work in film. Um, I, I go back and forth between film and theater. Um, I, I, when I moved to Los Angeles about six years ago, I was actually promoting a, uh, a movie which I directed called Hitting the Ground. Oh, yes, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, um, and, uh, but uh, in the subsequent years after that, I just became more and more involved in theater, and I'm still writing a lot of scripts and, and, and still invol involved very much in film. And but you did do theater in the East? Yeah. You, yes, I you, did. Do you direct it, or were you in acting, or uh, both? Both. I did. Uh, I haven't been acting as much in the last few years. I'm primarily focusing on directing, but uh, I studied acting in school, and um, and then acted in a lot of plays for for several years. Do your styles vary when you're directing a movie and when you're directing theater piece? Yeah, I I think with film, um, the director has to have a lot more of the answers figured out. Uh, certainly oh. before production begins, but you ha I think you have to have a more overall understanding of the script, the arc, the flow, and everything, because um, if you're lucky enough to get any rehearsal time, you know, you can start to put some of the pieces together there, and it's more of a collab. In film, you mean. In film, if you're lucky enough in film to get rehearsal with the cast, um, you know, that, that's a luxury, but most cases you get very little rehearsal time, and so the director has to have the answers mm -hmm. as to how these pieces and these scenes all fit in the overall arc of the of uh -huh. the film, whereas a play, I can start the process and know absolutely nothing about and the script and have no answers, and I prefer it that way because uh, then we have six weeks or three weeks or however long the rehearsal process is to, to figure that out together. So it's all rehearsal, basically. It's it basically in theater, it's all rehearsal time until you get to your finished product. Yeah, and, and in yeah. film, you're shooting the whole time. That's right. It's 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 it's. I uh, didn't think about my, that. My job's done opening night. So when the show right. actually starts to get, right. you know, uh, you know, take on a different life. I mean, I'm finished and done. Whereas is film, it's you know, you, there, there, there's more of a pre-production phase, and there are a lot oh, of I different see. phases. But it, in in terms of figuring out the material. Um, you know, you don't have, you can't change it uh, so much in film. I mean, you can change it in editing. You can right. try to change the meaning of something in editing, but uh, you know, once you've shot it, you've shot it, and it's on film. And, and then you, ha those are the materials you have to. Work you with. mentioned uh, hitting the ground, which was an indie film that you did. You write and direct? No, I uh, directed you it. You directed it, but yes. it won a lot of awards, mm -hmm. and um, it went to a lot of festivals. How did you get involved in that? Uh, I knew uh, a writer named Paul Mullen. Uh, who uh, I had gone to the University of Maryland with him, and uh, he had written a play called Hitting the Ground. Um, I knew the play well, and, and we just, I said it would make an interesting film, and we worked together to adapt it to a uh, screenplay, and um, uh. started involving lots and lots of people I knew, and it, it, was, a, it was a project that took years and years and years. To, oh, to, it to did? Bring, yes. Um, and, uh, but it was, uh, you know, once it was completed. What was it, the exact sto story? That is a story about a, a university newspaper photographer who um, inadvertently captures photographs of a woman committing suicide. Oh. And uh, when the editor of the newspaper uh, that he works for finds out about these photographs, he seeks to print them on the front page to create this splashy headline and advance his own career. And the photographer, troubled by this, uh, refuses to relinqu relinquish the film. And it becomes a conflict between the editor and a photographer. Um, uh, and the photographer is, is troubled on moral grounds where the, about exploitation, which is extremely uh, topical today. Even still. I was just going to say, you're from Maryland, and we're talking about exploitation and all this kind of uh, kind of unsavory things. Did you hang out in 
John Walters, uh, John Waters, Baltimore, John Walters, John Waters, Baltimore. Um, he's, you know, was in a, a <laughs> generation just slightly before me. But um, one thing I, I, I always admired about John Waters is that he really, uh, he captured a, a flavor of Baltimore, and he kept, he's always kept that with him. And he comes back, and he, and he, uh, I think is. His art is nurtured by Baltimore, and he, he needs really, it. Yeah, and he really needs that. And you know, I mean, he even you know, I remember uh, you know going into bars even after he was famous, and he would be just hanging out in the neighborhoods in Baltimore. I wondered if you came across him. Across yeah. him, yeah. Yeah. Well, he did very well for coming from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've uh, written screenplays for a lot of other projects too, I guess. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a couple of. Uh, I have one television show uh, that I co-wrote called um, Robot Chronicles, which is in development right now, um, and uh, written a couple of screenplays, uh, which are, uh, you know, various stages of options and things like that, but uh, nothing that's gone on to uh, uh, a major big blockbuster or anything like that yet, but, uh, but I've written lots and lots of short films and directed lots of those. I think the interesting thing when I was reading your bio was Group 101. What mm -hmm. is that? Um, <laughs> that was a group I, I uh, helped start with several friends a couple of years ago, which is um, it was a, a collective of six people, um, six or seven people got together once a month to uh, show a film or what you had to create one film per month oh that's what i thought and was every, every single person had to bring in a film once a month based around a the same topic which was introduced I that month for the next month and i was involved with the group for about six months and sort of creating it and getting it started and uh, i left because i was involved with some other plays but that group has gone on to huge success and is now uh, has has uh, affiliates in several cities and hundreds I of members it's now so it's so interesting huge. isn't it it's yeah. like taking a first year college course <laughs> yeah yeah it was it well, you know that was the, the only thing a, a lot of us were professional filmmakers or directors uh -huh. and, and writers and um we, but you know, sometimes you, you get lost in the sort of the business end, and, and we said, we, you have to create, you have to create constantly. Oh, so that, and that was, was the, the idea. Yeah, the eye behind it was just to, to get back to just starting over, and that's where the group 101, part of the the name came out of that, of starting over, I and see. just focusing oh. on the work starting itself. Starting at the beginning. Um, you talked about all this film work we've done, now you're, you're debut directing a theater piece in LA, is mm -hmm. that right? Called Abstract Expressionism. Right. Written it's, um, by Teresa Reebok. Yeah, Teresa Reebok, Abstract Expression. Um, yeah, it's the West Coast premiere of this I, play. It's, 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 it's uh, so I guess it'd be the b debut of the play, not Not your debut, debut. Yeah. <laughs> right, the debut uh, of the play, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it, how did you approach the script? Because it is a debut here. Did you see any of it before? No, no. Um, so how do you approach something like that? Well, what do you uh, do? Well, I, I, uh, I try not to answer all the questions at once. Um, when I read something, I just read it as a, an audience member to try to say, okay, how did this affect me? And, and what, did I, what do I take away from so it? So let's stop one minute. The Ch Chautauqua Theater Alliance came to you and said, we want you to direct this play. Yes, yeah, Stephanie okay, Bell, so the producer, right. uh, she and I had collaborated on a number of projects. Oh, so she, they she knew, knew me, you. Okay. And she brought me and I was introduced to the board. Okay, so now you're looking at it you're yeah. trying not to to uh, take everything in from yeah. the, the beginning and do you help cast it yes yes okay yeah i'm involved in all the casting there's usually a casting director involved in this case they had uh, um you know it was it was uh, in, inv invitation only casting but through so you sat so and listened hundreds to everything people, hundreds of you people. listened to all these people coming yeah. through yeah okay go on sorry um, <laughs> <laughs> and um and then once the ca uh, play is cast we have an initial reading and we just kind of and the first thing i do is i just start throwing out questions that occur to me i just start throwing out questions to the cast you know why do you think this is here you know whatever and oh. i and i tell people don't don't answer it necessarily right now but think about these questions that i'm asking and um and that way, uh, we had about five weeks of rehearsal in this particular play. And, and it, it, over those five weeks, we, we answer those questions. And we start oh, to, and then of course I ask more and more questions along the way, but it is it's a hugely collaborative effort um, in that way. And I, I, Do you pay attention to what they say to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I, I, I don't actually... always agree, but, but uh, quite often, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've come to discover I'm stupid, so <laughs> I no. try to, no, but I mean, I, I don't always have the answers, and, and I prefer that, that the answers come from everybody. I, I went to um, 
a dress rehearsal, mm -hmm. which was interesting because usually I go opening night or when the play is in process and I see the director who kind of sits back and watches his work on the stage and he laughs and I always get so interested in how the director still sees this material as fresh, uh -huh. laughing, you know, grimacing. And you were sitting there laughing at what was going on, but you were also banging your book. <laughs> I've never seen, you know, so I haven't been during this directorial kind of thing, which was part of your direction, I guess. Um, last night was an exercise that I do uh, often uh, late in the, in the rehearsal process, usually a few days before opening, when I feel like that the play has a lot of great pieces. Uh, and there are certain elements of arc in the, in the play, but there's no rhythm to the piece. Uh. Um, and I think every piece has to find a rhythm. And, and by that point, you know, hopefully, I understand what the rhythm of the play should be. Because we open, and you, know, you saw it yesterday, yes, and the play right. opens in two days. Right. So, um, and what I was doing, that, that banging, uh, was, was told the cast, speed up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, speeding them yeah, up. Yeah, so it was like conducting the play, like a conductor would conduct I see. an orchestra. And then... Do they listen to you? Were they yeah, doing they were. things? And, yeah, I and that's why the, that's why the play was flying last night. But so many things uh, come to light. Sometimes the, the cast, you know, a scene suddenly makes sense when it's done quickly or slowly oh. or changes pace. And so what I was doing last night was conducting the piece. Oh, you were? You were changing the pace? Yeah. Do you die inside when your actor doesn't remember the line. What happens to a director at that point? I'm sure the actor's going, what, what am I doing? But what yeah. does the director do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> nine times out of ten, I'm <laughs> I'm psychically sending them the line. That's what I'm wondering. Like, are you dying yeah, you know, inside? Usually, uh, I really feel for the actor. I want you know. I understand exactly what they're going through, and, and usually, what I'm saying inside is, "Don't panic." I know they know the line. Just relax, breathe through it, and keep going. And and almost always, it, it, it's it's it happens. It does happen. How yeah. do you build the confidence in your actors to just keep going like that? You just before it happens or after it happens? Well, I really, I, I believe strongly in muscle memory for yeah. actors, that, that if they've done something enough times, their uh -huh. bodies often tell them what to do next. And, and that's what I, hopefully, and I say to oh, actors, that you get to a certain place where you're out of your head, where they're not thinking anymore, but their bodies are just telling them what to do. And, and therefore, they're just actually, you know, and that's when you're saying the line for the first time, even though they've said it a hundred million times prior to that performance, they're saying it for the first time and they're really listening for the first time and they're not thinking about, okay, what do I have to do next, but they're oh, really you mean in it's that like, place. It's part of it. They, yeah. they, it's like they're actually living what they're supposed well, to they're be living. Well, right. they're, they're doing it. They're doing it. And that's, is that that's it? what I'm always saying is, you know, stop thinking, do. It's at the uh, Egyptian Arena, mm -hmm. and I think um, the Chautauqua Theater Alliance is using that as a home mm -hmm. theater. Yes. Will you be doing anything else with them? I hope so. I, I had a great experience with this. It was, it was a fantastic uh, group of people, and yes, I hope so. I hope so. It was r really interesting, and I want to see it now out of rehearsals to yeah. see how you react to the <laughs> audience. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Dave Moore for being here with us. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Wendy Holden, our shoe designer. That was great. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back. Shoe designer Wendy Holden was born and raised in New York. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Parsons. She's worked in the fashion world with Leon Max. Wendy, uh, why shoes and not fashion per se? Well, from the time I was about five years old, I dreamt about shoes all the time. <laughs> It was so weird. Your poor mother. Was yeah. she buying you shoes all the time? I lived in New York, and I used to buy incredible shoes on sale on Madison Avenue, the most amazing stuff. And um, I just dreamt about them all the time, but I never did anything professional with them. Oh, I was going to say, because you taught fashion history and draping at UCLA. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you were very much a part of fashion, not that shoes... I mean, I look at shoes as an accessory rather than a fashion statement. My original interest when I went to Parsons was industrial design. I wanted uh. to design objects that people use. 
So I came to fashion late, and uh. um, I didn't really study too much industrial design at Parsons because it didn't really exist at that time there. And um, so when I discovered shoes, my interest in sculpture and uh. industrial design and fashion came together, and it was a shoe. It was a shoe, but you were still doing other things at the time, I right? Was. I was just pursuing shoes. As a you person. were collecting shoes. So yeah, I've always collected shoes, just sort of. Um, I mean, you have in a hundreds of way. shoes, I don't do. you? Yeah, I do. What, tell us a little bit about how you know a shoe is a good shoe to collect. Oh, you know, just like any person who collects anything that they just have a response to. I mean, they're shoes that make me cry. <laughs> Indian shoes tend to lately really just make my heart stand still. Where do the, where do you find these shoes? Uh, eBay. Um, oh, you do. Vintage shows, garage sales. People bring me shoes. I met a guy at a party once who showed up at my doorstep the next day. He lived down the street from me, and he brought me a pair of Lebanese men's shoes that were shaped like boats. Oh, they're do so you, beautiful. Do you have to authenticate them, or it doesn't matter? You know, matter. I'm not a serious collector in that way. I'm just I, a completely um, emotional collector. There's a museum in Toronto, the Bata Museum. That's where I cried over the Indian shoes. Oh, I see. Yeah because Edward Mader, who used to work at the LA County Museum, was there, and I had the gr great luck of being shown through the whole back of the collection by him, and it just blew my mind. You know, um, FIDM has a shoe program, and you taught that? I did. How could they have just a shoe program? I'm just, like, fascinated. I love shoes. I mean, I think they're beautiful, and your shoes are beautiful, but we need to know <laughs> a little bit why they had a shoe program. Well, you know, shoes are completely separate business from fashion. I'm going to just hold these while you're talking. Completely separate. So that the people who work in shoes, really, they know what trends are in fashion, but it's a completely separate pursuit. And it's technically so advanced what you have to know in order to design a shoe, especially these days, with sports shoes and athletic shoes and Nikes and all of that stuff being so important. Technically, there's so much to learn. But you don't do the cobbler. You're not at the bench, are you? No, I'm not every day. I mean, I but can you make could a shoe. Be? Yeah, oh, I you learned, can. I, I know how to make a shoe. Oh, yeah. so you? Oh, that's why you could teach it. That's what I wondered. Well, and we don't teach shoemaking there. Like at the shoemakers school in London, they really make shoes right. more. They don't really make a shoe at Fitum, but they learn about technical constraints. And there's so many um, special ways of uh, drawing to communicate your ideas to factories right now. Does it make a more. difference? Yeah. Does does it make a difference? You seem to be, you have these slides, shoes that you slide into. Yes. Did you ever make shoes with the backs? I did make shoes with backs, but technically in Los Angeles, I'm really working like with a guy who's hammering and making my shoes in the back of his house. And I found that this shoe, because I make them for individual people, I can get the best fit and have the most control over the, what the heels to are the different, shoe. or the heels are the, the same? The heels are the same height, but they're all different shapes. Like this is a sort of high, skinny, he skinnier heel, and this is a real period heel called a Louis heel. Oh, here I have it this way. And there's these glass heels. So as many, I try to make as many choices and as many details packed into every shoe as I can. And and how does somebody find you? <laughs> just like this. I just like just I, the just, way you found me. I just found you. You just <laughs> told me you were designing shoes. I think this is so beautiful. This little pleated center here. Yeah. And, and how, does somebody come in and give you fabric, or do you have the fabric? I can use any fabric in the whole world. I've made fabrics. I've made shoes with other people's, you know, antique fabrics and embroidered fabrics, and I have as many fabrics as I can possibly find. And people pick all of their own combinations. So you love this shoe, but I make it in all of your choices. But your shoe is not the kind of shoe, oh, I love this. Your shoe isn't the kind of my shoe slipper. that's going to match a bridesmaid's dress. Not in general. <laughs> the brides I've done have been untraditional brides. And this has a flat heel. Yeah, that's my slipper, really. It really? They've just made it for me and a couple of friends as our slippers. It's so great. But you did work for some shoe companies. Yeah, I had a really short association with Charles Jourdain, and that's what made me know that I could really be a serious shoe designer. And you spent a lot of time with Leon Max. And I did a lot of accessories when I was there, too. Did so you do I accessories? Always, I was always very interested in the embellishment character of things, the embellished character. That's what I love, is detail, embellishment, pattern, texture, color. So I did that a lot there. And do, and you you go out and find this fabric. <coughs> How much fabric does it take to make a shoe? I always say one foot per foot. 
One basically. foot? Basically. So, you know, like a square foot uh -huh. of fabric for each foot of the shoe. So, it's easy. It's e like if you're making cushions out of an incredible Fortuny fabric for your That's couch, the me, leftover yeah. fabric, I can make a shoe out of. That's oh. really, and I do that for people. Do you do that? Sure. Silk velvets, you know, incredibly expensive fabrics that people have brought back from places. The scraps, I can pretty much work into a shoe. So do you, ha how do you start? If I come in to buy a pair of shoes from you, what do you do? Do you measure my foot? I measure your foot. I crawl around to the floor. I measure your foot. I trace your foot. And that's what I use as my template. And um, either you fall in love with a certain style, like this is a rather tailored style, and there's some people that like these, and they don't like all the things with ruffles and ruches on them, like what I like. And so we start with the style, and then we pick out fabrics to work with that style, or the opposite. And then? And then um, uh, I have a big, So huge, I want a fluffy one. You want I a want something, one. yeah. I want some so pleats on it. So I have tons of swatches. <laughs> and we pull out the swatches, and we scrunch them up and put them on the shoe so you can visualize what's going to happen. And like with this shoe, for example. And uh, this is really fun to do, and it has such great colors. And um, I go home, and usually I pick out the trim uh. color, just because we usually forget to talk about that. And I make as many design decisions as I possibly can on every shoe. It's like remodeling your kitchen. And um, in about six weeks, you'll have a shoe made to fit your own foot. Do you, do you go then to the bench and watch the cobbler? Oh, yeah, I visit him all the time. Oh, you do? Yeah, because, you know, there, because it's a handmade object, there's so many vagaries of fate, you know, for That's each That's what one. I wondered. And does the heel make a difference on the way it fits? Not all the time, but people have different sensitivities in their feet. You learn so much about weird stuff, you know, doing what I do. There are people who really can't, who can feel, you know, the, the bulk of the heel underneath their foot, so they uh -huh. need more stability or less stability, or, you know, it's a rather delicate thing, surprisingly so. The um, collection of shoes that you have, have mm -hmm. you shown them anywhere? Um, I show them at friends' stores often. I used to have a spot in a friend's antique store. They go really well with furniture and antiques and accessories. But just as a art piece. I haven't done that. I've talked to a couple of people about doing like a gallery Because you, you don't sell the collection of shoes that you own, right. your own collection. Oh, my own collection, no, I don't sell Have those. you ever curated any shows? No, but yeah, I've talked to different people about just filling a case in a gallery or something of all of my stuff. That would be but, beautiful. But what about museum shows? Don't they it's do shows? Um, you know, I wish that the LA County Museum did a richer fashion show program because they have such an incredible collection and there's so many people here who could. Do they have a lot of shoes in their collection? They have tons of shoes. They have great stuff. Well, tell, take us through some of the shoes that would be important. 40s shoes, 20s shoes. Well, Come out of the past, out of the... Well, they're shoes that are important to designers at the moment because it's what's happening now in fashion, you know? so. Recently, platforms came back. They just I came see. back, you know? So the 40s and the 30s were what all the designers were looking at. And now some of the more eccentric shapes are coming back, more elongated toes or something. So people are always, designers, like mainstream designers, are always referencing different periods in history. So they go back and look that. at the museum? Absolutely. And oh, they see all what, do. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's a fit, FIT in New York and at the Met. You go in there as a designer and you research in the collection. And here, too. And does that give you the height and tell you how to exactly. structure it? And I'm, I'm totally convinced that Prada and Gucci and all those people, they're taking the actual shoe, they're dissecting it, they're replicating every single thing about it because all of those tiny little considerations make a huge difference in a shoe. Just a tiny difference in the skew of the heel. And they can see that when they look, like Manolo. Right. He, he, he doesn't lift from other people. But, but sure. he, um, makes the highest heels, or Jimmy Choo he, makes the yeah, highest they heels. Make Who very makes the high, high Those guys make very high heels, and, yeah. And don't they have to be balanced in a certain way? Those Italian craftsmen are so brilliant. They just, they know things that none of us will ever know. <laughs> so even if you know how to do that shoe, there's some intricacies. That's what right. are the intricacies? I do it by instinct, but the Italian craftsmen and technicians there, they have, you know, not only centuries of shoes behind them, but what they know technically about uh, um, grading things on a computer, all that kind of stuff. They and use what they computers know about now. Feet. I think they do. Uh -huh. Yeah.
Um, it's very, very delicate. And that's why Blahnik shoes fit so beautifully, even if it's such a high heel and such a strange toe, your foot still fits perfectly inside of it without being too contorted. That's because of those amazing Italian uh, Knowing technicians. how to build it. That's right. And I really can't do that kind of a job here because we just don't have those people here, you know. But you didn't go to shoe school. <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew so much about shoes from my early years on Madison Avenue that um, I didn't have to. You didn't have to go yeah. to shoe. And, but you did know how, you did have to learn how to s structurally make a shoe. I did, but it was also pretty instinctive for me because for my whole life too, I've worn strange shoes. I never wore sneakers. I never wore work boots. I always knew what it was like to have my foot in a very delicate, strange object. When you all, when all is said and done, <laughs> are you thinking of giving your collection to a it's museum? Funny, I am thinking, yeah. And um, you know, the LA County Museum makes sense, except at the same time, I just feel like they don't do enough with their collection. So. I'd love people to see my work, yeah, ultimately. If it but I think things. you have to start curating some shows. Good and idea. Then, uh, put, you can borrow from different museums around the country, Absolutely. can't you? Sure, I'm sure. And use, your, <clears throat> use your show as a base. But can you work in, in leather? I, I can work in leather. Um, Shoemaking is such a strange and um, uh, sort of archaic system so that each thing that's done on the shoe is done by a different person. Um, so doing leather adds a completely different craftsman into what I do, and it's too complicated to get everything um, right. This is what I know I can get right every single time. Well, this is what we want, a Wendy Holden shoe. <laughs> and I want to thank Pierre Picot for letting us use his Aren't art they today. they I love beautiful. his work with my shoes. Beautiful. And thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, and we'll see you next time <laughs> on the Joan Quinn Profiles. That was so fast and so fun. What time?